Have you ever wondered why board games are shaped the way that they are? When it comes to board game packaging, most board games are square shaped so that they can be catalogued, stacked and displayed easily on your shelf. But when it comes to designing a game and translating it into a fully fledged board game, the shape of a game is the first thing that designers often think about. On my windowsill are two of the most popular modern board games, Carcassonne and Catan. Carcassonne uses these square shaped tiles to create an ever evolving map, whilst Catan uses these hexagonal shaped tiles to create an island of where players are going to be settling throughout the game. In this video, we're going to be looking at which of these two tile shapes is better. Squares are particularly interesting quadrilaterals. They have four corners, four equal sides, and their diagonal distances are longer than the sides of the square itself. Squares are often used in board games with an architectural theme, one where players are building a city, or they're expanding a grid-like network of maps and roads, or they're wandering through a, an abandoned building of different rooms where, where they have to move their characters orthogonally. Squares are really good because they can be easily joined together with other squares to make rectangles in games that uses dominoes, for example, or they can be used uh, to create interesting lines of sight. Squares are very simple shapes to work with and very simple to understand and games like chess have exploited the use of a square grid in many ways over the years. Squares are really easy to subdivide. You can take a really big square and split it into multiple rows and columns and keep doing that as far as you like. You can also join adjacent squares together to extend the grid horizontally or vertically to extend the map out and that can be done quite simply. But when it comes to movement around a square shaped grid, there are a couple of things to note. If we consider this little figurine here, it's got eight options of places where it can move. It can move up, down, left, right, or into one of the four diagonal spaces. If this figure was on the edge of the board, its movement freedom would be greatly restricted. In this case, it would only have three spaces it could move into. Now, there's a really interesting thing that happens when you're trying to replicate movement on a map in real life. For example, moving over here would take one square space of movement. However, if we excluded the diagonals and we just moved only orthogonally, it would actually take two squares of movement to move into that same space. This presents an interesting conundrum. And this is quite important when it comes to moving characters in a game that's trying to replicate a theme in real life. I mean, why would players want to move into an adjacent space when they could simply skip one space and move diagonally? The idea that moving one space diagonally is not the same distance as moving one space orthogonally is an interesting dilemma that game designers have to contend with. Board games that implement this square-based grid system often have to impose restrictions on their players to moving orthogonally only, meaning that what once was eight potential moves is now narrowed down to four. This really long world map from the board game Now or Never is a prime example of why game designers limit players' ability to move diagonally across fantasy maps. If this particular character wanted to move into this diagonal space, they would need to expend two units of movement. If they would then need to move diagonally again, they would need to expend another two units of movement. Usually it would only require one unit. And a lot of games do this. In this particular game, it accentuates the theme of going on a journey, that you have to expend a lot of energy to travel that distance. And it also maintains that sense of fairness, that when you move one space, it should be the same distance no matter which direction that you're moving in. And I can totally understand where all of this originates from. One of the first things we're introduced in maths is the idea of a treasure map, and finding treasure requires the use of a coordinate based system. So the treasure is at A7. Or playing games like Battleship, where you have to find out where the ships are located in this orderly fashion. The hexagon is a very common shape used in many modern board games. In fact, it's a shape that tessellates extremely well. In Settlers of Catan, the hexagon emulates this beautiful rugged coastline that surrounds the Isle of Catan that all players are attempting to settle. I like how the designer of this game has exploited many different parts of the geometry of a hexagon really well. First of all, the hexagon tile itself represents a particular resource that players are going to gather, and the way they're placed out at the beginning of the game is quite randomised, 
representing resource diversity. Secondly, the edge of the hexagon represents different pathways where players can lay their roads down to try and connect the longest road or to connect to particular trading ports. And finally, the corners of the hexagons are where players are going to be building their settlements and upgrading them to a city. It's also the junction point between three hexagons where players are going to be gathering their resources when the two dice are rolled. This is a really beautiful demonstration of how hexagons can be exploited in a board game in a really intuitive manner. When it comes to emulating the geography and topography of the true natural features of a map in a board game, using a hex grid based system is actually particularly effective. The hex system, because they tessellate, offers some really angular lines that occurs around the edge of your game. And depending on where you are on the map, each and every space offers you six different options and six different directions for you to move in. And those directions can be exploited in different ways. You could either move directly in a line of sight in six different ways, or you can choose to move and then change direction each and every time without losing any action points or distance. Takenoko uses the hex grid system in particularly unique and interesting ways. Adding a new plot tile to any edge in the garden allows players to shape the look of the garden as the game progresses. Secondly, placing a water channel on the edge of a plot tile allows players to irrigate the different types of bamboo that grow there. Moving the gardener or the panda around the map is particularly an interesting experience. Because both characters can only move in one direction in one single line of sight, making them land on certain tiles is particularly fun. And trying to pivot them in six different directions every time they move is also an ingenious piece of game design. So this is a really good case of where the geography of a garden is directly related to the way players wish to move and navigate it. I'm always truly fascinated when it comes to tile laying games and the sorts of shapes that game designers use in their games to create a fun experience. Marcusone exploits this use of the square tile exceptionally well. The tile design is particularly intuitive and simple, yet it provides for some interesting decisions when it comes to deciding where you're going to place it on your turn. On the edge of the tiles, it features one of three different types of terrain, a road, a castle, or just plain greenery. And this provides some really cool opportunities for designing a series of tiles that contain a variety of different combinations of these things. This particular tile has three roads and one castle. This particular tile has two greeneries and two castles. Being able to play and toy with the different edge combinations means that when you're building this map each and every game, there's different positions to place them in. And an interesting thing to note is that you can build these little alcoves that look like this, where you can simply place a tile that matches those three edges to complete it, which is really cool. Another really important feature to notice is that every time players place a square tile in Carcassonne, it opens up more options for future tile placements. By placing a tile on the edge of the game board like this, you're opening up three new spaces. If you're putting it into a nook like this, you're opening up two new spaces. Land vs Sea is a map building game where players are trying to compete by building regions of land and also enclosed regions of ocean to score points. The hexagon shaped tiles here play a very critical role. When you place a hexagon tile so it attaches to an existing part of the map, it potentially opens up to five extra spaces where future tiles could be placed. The fact that these hexagon shaped tiles tessellate really well means that there's lots of different places where the adjacency of the tiles can connect together very easily, just like this water and land space. Henceforth, you could even rotate the tile so that it fits in spaces like this one here. An interesting comparison to make here is that with the hexagon from Land vs Sea, the design has a little bit more ample opportunity to play with the sort of terrain that you'll see on the edges of the hexagon. The fact that the tiles in Land vs Sea are double-sided provides more ample opportunity for playing around with this cool effect and design element. So it's pretty clear that in this example, the hexagon provides players with way more options than the square shaped tiles. Just because a game uses a square shaped tile in its design doesn't actually mean that that game is any less complex. In fact, it can sometimes be a little bit more layered. And this is where King Domino comes in. King Domino attaches two squares together to create a rectangle. And all of a sudden, you go from four different options to six different options. Take that, hexagon.
So all of a sudden, by making this very simple geometric amendment, this tile is now giving a hexagon a run for its money. You can take these dominoes and place them in this zone in different ways. They could be placed so it's connected like that to create a region of three. Or it could be placed over here like this to complete a region of two forests, but also increase the scoring point value of this water section. So just when you think that the square has finally relished in its glory in terms of one-upping a hexagon in terms of its design shape, well, the game Gods Love Dinosaurs takes dominoes to a whole new level, and that is to connect two hexagons together to make a polyhex. Polyhexes have an interesting shape to them, and when you attach a polyhex to an established map, they provide players with up to 10 different options of different ways they can be connected together. You've got five on this side and five on this side. So when you place it in a map building game like this, you can kind of attach them together in different ways. They can be attached like this, so the terrain extends outwards, or they can be matched and paired together like this, so that these two terrains are extended forwards. This creates so many more options than if you just used a single shape alone. There are quite a few other ways that tiles are used in games. In fact, if you like building mazes, often tiles are used in games to create pathways. And in this game, Nagaraja, a really fantastic dice rolling two player game, players are trying to find their ways to different treasures that exist in their temple. And by placing and bidding for these particular tiles, they can create little pathways from the entrances to little jewels and gemstones, as well as uncovering different treasures. Pretty shiny, don't you think? It also creates some interesting choices when it comes to deciding how routes are going to be placed out onto your map. By starting with a T-shaped route, you're kind of limiting your access to certain parts of the temple. But using a cross tile like this can help you to complete a junction. Whistle Stop is a game that takes this maze route building element and wraps it around this train delivery theme. In Whistle Stop, players are moving their trains across this spaghetti-like board to try and deliver particular types of coloured cubes to their destinations to earn victory points. Here, players are going to be picking tiles, they're going to be placing it in these gaps, and then bridging those connections as the game progresses. Here, the use of a hexagon to join three pairs of edges together is incredibly intuitive. An interesting design note here that shows the complexity of this game is the fact that each of these two stations are connected to three different edges. This grey cube station is connected to these three edges, whereas this brown one's connected to these three edges. You can see that all of the six edges do have a connection of somewhat, so that when they're placed in a different configuration on this board, they can be rotated so that however they match up, will create different pathways each time. And that might be crucial to developing that final connection to get your train to its destination. And what this has consistently shown so far is that hexagons always provide that extra flexibility, that extra level of option that squares don't often provide. Ah, uh, Danny, what about polyomino tiles? They're simply lots of different squares joined together in different ways to make lots of different shapes. That's pretty ingenious, isn't it, don't you think? Maybe that should be left for another video. A lot of board games like chess often exploit the use of shape extremely well. In chess, each piece has a different way that it moves across its square grid. Onitama is a variation of chess where players are dabbling in up to five different actions that are shared between both of them. And this action creates a pattern of movement which allows their piece to progressively move across the board and try and knock out the other pawns and try and capture the opponent's king at the same time. This use of a square grid pattern to influence movement and strategy in a game is particularly interesting. Oh look, checkmate. Hive is a chess style game that completely throws the idea of having a confined grid out the window altogether. There are two design elements that I really like in the game Hive. First of all, these hex shaped pieces are used to create the actual structure of the Hive itself, which is ever evolving, ever changing, and it's not going to be the same from game to game. Second of all, each piece is a bug of some sort, and each bug has its own ability that exploits and moves around the hive in some way. For example, the ant can move to any exterior location, but you've got things like the grasshopper that can jump across a series of hex pieces in its line of sight. 
Then you've got things like the spider that can move three spaces around the edge of the hive. All of these movement abilities intertwined in this ever-evolving structure just really showcases how amazing a hexagon can be. So which of these two shapes do you think is implemented most effectively in some of your favourite modern board games? Are you Team Square or Team Hexagon? Or are you both? Please let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. Love to hear what you have to say. I personally gravitate towards the hexagon just because the shapes feel more organic when it comes to map building but also uh, the options that players have. But I also like games that use the square effectively and when games can kind of marry the shape of the game to the me mechanisms and their theme and they can do it well, then that says to me that it doesn't really matter what shape the game is the game is going to be fun regardless. Thanks once again for joining me and making it this far in the video. If you really found this video super curious and helpful, then please consider giving me a like and subscribe. I would really appreciate it. Please don't forget to head over to my Patreon page and check that out. Otherwise, I look forward to bringing you some more amazing board game content in the future. This is Danny signing out. I'll see you next time. Triangles. Curious. Curious indeed.